All right. Uh, welcome to the uh, M Cube weekly seminar. Uh, today, we're very happy to have uh, Bill Quo coming back to M Cube to, uh, to, to give us a talk. Uh, Bill's been around this place a very long time, uh, not as long as I have, but uh, he came as a student in 1981. Uh, we hired him on staff here in 1983, uh, before there was an MMM, and uh, he became a senior scientist in 1995. Uh, early on, he led the development of uh, MM4 and MM5. He played a key role in the development of WARF and its research applications. He served on, as an advisor to more than 25 graduate students and mentored more than 15 postdoctoral fellows. Uh, publications include more than 180 uh, journal ar articles as well as numerous conference uh, articles and reports. Uh, his scientific interests include hurricanes, uh, extropical cyclones, uh, mesoscale convective systems, heavy rainfall prediction, data simulation, just about everything in, 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 our, in our field. Uh, since 2015, uh, Bill Quo has directed the UCARS uh, portfolio for community programs. Uh, from 2009 to 2018, he also directed the Developmental uh, Testbed Center, which is a collaborative effort uh, of NCAR and several federal agencies to bring together practitioners in the weather modeling community and facilitate uh, the transition of numerical weather prediction uh, research to operations. From uh, 1997 to 2015, Bill directed UCAR's COSMIC uh, program uh, in collaboration with Taiwan, and he put the uh, world's first uh, GPS uh, radio occultation satellite uh, constellation in orbit in 2006. Since then, the system has provided critical observations to support both atmospheric research and uh, operational forecasting at uh, weather prediction centers around the world. Uh, the follow-on COSMIC-2 mission is designed to increase observational capabilities, and um, that is the subject of today's talk, uh, improving tropical cyclogenesis and heavy rainfall prediction with radio occultation and data, COSMIC-2 mission. Bill? Uh, oh, thank you. Yours. Before I start, I, I wanted to tell you a story that uh, as I grew up at MQ, uh, I would say that giving MQ seminar is the most uh, no cracking experience <laughs> because I got tough audience here. Uh, they always ask tough questions. So uh, I have been, my practice is that uh, I try to go give talks elsewhere before I come back to MQ. <laughs> Make sure I'm prepared <laughs> to answer the tough questions. Um, today, I'm really happy to give this presentation. I always consider uh, MQ my home, and it's nice to be back here and to give this talk. Um, the reason why I wanted to give this talk, talk also is that the satellite uh, is becoming a very important platform for our science. And actually within NCA and UCP, there's a lot of exciting work being done related to satellite. Uh, and however, there have not been a lot of interaction among the different group and with, under Deb Edwards' uh, leadership, we have uh, a remote sensing initiative that is funded by the ECA President's uh, Strategic Initiative Funds. And the whole idea here is to stimulate more collaborations uh, in using the satellite uh, and for uh, developing new missions and for applying for our science. And um, so one of uh, the goal here is to give seminar to promote the uh, collaboration. And so, uh, if they agree, this is considered the first, first series of the seminar. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you already heard about the radio occultation. So I'm going to just uh, kind of give you a refresher on what is radio occultation uh, and the mission we had in the past and how we can use it to improve tropical cyclogenesis and heavy rainfall predictions. So the concept about you know, related to radio occultation actually start in the late uh, 60s, and people wanted to study the Martian's atmosphere, and you cannot really fly an airplane there and make a drop sound. So how do you know better about the structure and atmosphere uh, over the Mars? And they come back with a clever idea, that is you can send a satellite, try to orbit uh, around the Mars, and then you can transmit radio wave behind the Mars toward the Earth. 
And as the satellite is rising or setting, the frequency would change, and the frequency uh, change can be related to how much bending of the ray would be. And from that bending, you can then deduce information on the densities. And so um, the challenge here is, of course, uh, how would that work on Earth? And if you want to have that operate on Earth, you got two major problems. Number one, compared to the Mars, Earth is very, very well observed. So does it really make a difference with the radio quotation? You got radio sound, you got other satellite, you got you know, commercial aircraft. Well, number two is that to maintain that constant radio source is very expensive. And so it uh, so happened that we have the GPS, the Global Positioning Satellite System that developed by the militaries in the 70s, and we can use that um, signal for radio quotation. And just to give you an illustration on how this works is that, uh, you know, we have this GPS system. And so it actually consists of 24 satellites uh, in six orbital planes, and they concentrate bombarding the Earth with radio waves. So if your phone can receive that signal from three satellites, you can figure out their, their location uh, on, on Earth. So how we are trying to do here is that, okay, we have this satellite orbiting around the Earth. So if you put a tiny uh, satellite here, and you can, you can, as your satellite is uh, setting or rising behind the Earth, and you can calculate the frequency change of that radio wave. And from that, that change, on the, on, we call it the phase change, you can go back and invert how much bending you have. You can actually figure out how much bending you have. And so with that, you can actually get the, we call the vertical profile of bending angle at the ray parity point. And from that, you, in, you can invert uh, refractivities. And refractivity is really the equivalent of density. And that, you can use that to retrieve uh, electron density profile, temperature, and water vapor. And so uh, the, the whole principle about radio quotation is based on refraction. And the one imp important aspect about the atmosphere is that, well, uh, we have gradual change on air density. So that would actually cause a gradual bending. So for example, here, if you have a ray coming in, because of that gradual uh, density change, the ray will gradually be bended. And it's just when you do that for the water, because of the sudden change, you don't have that bending. So it's really related to the atmosphere structure. And as, as I said it here, is that our satellite, we can put a small satellite uh, behind the Earth as we uh, set or rise behind the Earth, and you can measure the bending angle and as a vertical pole of bending angle right at the ray parity point here. And um, so interestingly, if we kind of draw a straight line, uh, say, from, uh, say from GPS uh, to, to this uh, straight line here, so your satellite actually is taking measurement below the zero line, <laughs> so it actually, uh, you, you can measure it, um, I call it, uh, you, you know, you, you throw a straight line here, and your satellite is actually can take a measurement below the, the zero line. And it's actually kind of interesting because uh, uh, if you look at, uh, this is a plot coming from Sergei Sogorovsky from Cosmic, and what he was plotting on this graph is that um, you have a, we call it the phase change, the frequency change, associated with the radio occultation. And so this is the, the zero point. So when your satellite is uh, above the zero nine, that tangent nine, it's all this nine, it's called a zero. And um, you can take measurement. And of course, as you go to higher in the atmosphere, you find that you can receive uh, the signal very, very strongly because you don't have anything to block or scatter your, your signals. Uh, and, but on the other hand, because you don't have a lot of air uh, density change, you don't get a lot of bending, a lot of frequency change either. So in the stratosphere, uh, you know, you get a strong signal, but the bending itself, or the frequency change is very small. 
when you get to the, you know, here is we actually try to take measurement to 200 kilometer below the horizontal line. And so when you get to lower part of the atmosphere, you actually get very strong frequency change. However, the, the amplitude is very weak because defocusing, convection, you know, all kind of disturbance is making it very difficult. And I can tell you, this is really the most difficult part of the measurement because, because and, and, uh, and, and actually in my opinion, this is uh, the most important part because if you really want to improve the weather prediction, you really need to do better when you get close to the surface. And if you look at this diagram, there's one, how we call it the sweet spot, is run here. It's about minus 50 to about maybe plus 50 here. And this is the reason, the, the region where you still get strong bending, you also get strong signals. And no wonder if in the European Center a couple of years ago, they did an analysis of, uh, they called it the uh, focus sensitivity to observation, basically measuring how sensitive the focus improvement would be to the observation. And when you look at the radio quotation, well, guess what? You know, here's the surface and you go up to 50 kilometers. Look at where the sweet spot would be. It's basically about 10 kilometers to about 20, 20 kilometers here. This is the place where the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere, you got strong signals, strong bending. So you got the best perfect observation. And then under the hand here, you know, the European Center say, well, you know, below three, four kilometers, you know, where your quotation doesn't offer very useful contributions. We can ignore them. And in fact, um, most of the time, you know, you, you go to uh, the data simulation system, you find that they actually put near the surface 20% error as observational error. So basically, there's so much uncertainty, they just ignore it. They don't want to use it. Well, anyway, that's actually the focus of my talk today, how we can milk more information out of this part so that we, we the people, can get something useful out of radio quotation. So the first um, radio quotation mission was was actually led by Yuka. Uh, we had GPS men. I still remember I was sitting at MQ. One day I got a phone call from Rick. Rick Anthes, he said, Bill, do you want to be involved with GPS men? I said, what's that? I never heard of that. <laughs> so he was telling me about this, and so we got involved. And so this is the first uh, mission led by Yuka, and we don't even have money to have a dedicated mission, so we actually uh, collaborate with, uh, with Orbital Science Corporation, and they gave us a real estate and on a satellite called MicroLab 1. And he said, well, why are you putting an aircraft over here? Actually, look at that. And the Betty underneath the Betty, it's called a Pegasus uh, launch vehicle. You put a satellite underneath of the, the airplane, and it go into the midair, and it launch from there. And so, um, so this is actually the first, the, the red line here is the first radio occultation um, profile we got from this called, uh, proof of concept mission called GPS MET. And, I, and we happen to have a radio song in the purple dot here and showing nearby and it show is right on the money for most of the place. But you also notice that um, you don't have profile below seven kilometers. And that was the reason is because that when we did the GPS mat, we took the, uh, the, we took the receiver off the shelf. It's a commercial low end receiver and we put it in there. There's no real uh, fancy tracking uh, algorithm. So the satellite actually start losing track around seven kilometers. And so when we get a great success on on GPS med and we try to sell the mission to NOAA and we got basically tell us to uh, get out of the, you know, to leave because they say, well, you don't get any data up below seven kilometers, who cares? It is, you know, this is not useful. And um, so it actually took a while uh, for us to, to, to make the next step. The next step here is that we actually uh, develop a new tracking algorithm called the open loop tracking. And the, 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 this one, what we had was using the lock loop track, and basically you have to predict what the next wave frequency would be so that you can do the measurement. So we luckily to have a opportunity to collaborate with Taiwan, and we were, they were looking for a mission to 
to do, and we suggest to them to in GPS Med, and they cooperate with us. And we launched the mission in 2006, and we have six satellites, and it's actually providing the global coverage. And Cosmic was actually the first one that used, demonstrated the use of radio quotation data in operational weather prediction. And so we are really excited, particularly over the tropic and southern hemisphere. The red dot here is showing you the radio sound, so you don't really get a lot over the southern hemisphere and the tropics. So I just want to show you a picture. We were very, very happy. This is on the lunch, lunch day, <laughs> 2006. Um, anyway, uh, suddenly I look a lot younger. Um, so Cosmic was uh, designed to last for five years. <laughs> We finally turned it off in 2020 after operating 14 years. And of course, you know, it's a six satellite constellation. It gradually decay, uh, but it made it basically up to 14 years, we have to shut it off. And it's interesting to, to compare the cost of radio sound versus uh, radio quotation. We spend about $140 million and we get about 7 million profiles. So back up the Ember calculation is $20 per profile. And you know how much it's going to cost. Maurice, do you know how much it costs for a radio song? $150. And then you have to pay for the helium, pay for surprise. You have to have people launching it. By the time you add it up, it's probably $1,000. I don't know. But anyway, so uh, I think it's still it's a very cost-effective uh, observing system. So in 2008, we start planning for uh, Cosmic 2 mission as a follow-on, and we finally got it launched in June 2019. And this one is focused over the tropics. You might wonder why we are only doing the tropics. Actually, the original plan for Cosmic was having the two satellite constellation, one with low inclination focusing on the tropic, and the other one with high inclination that cover the polar region and mid-latitude regions. But, uh, but we only got the funding from the government for the tropics. That's how it, how it works. Uh, it's very successful. Um, it's, um, uh, it's been providing about 6,000 profile per day since then. So this is the Cosmic 2 um, satellite. And uh, there's one place where I want to emphasize. So of course, you see the solar panel. There is a, you call it ion velocity meter. This is for space weather. And this is called the precision orbit determination uh, we receive I mean, antenna that is really helping tracking the location of the satellite. And what are these 12 cones? These are actually high gain antenna phase array. And why is it important? Because as your satellite is moving, you know, maybe toward, say I'm moving toward Bill's camera here, but your source, your GPS, is located to the right. And your view antenna is only pointing to the direction of where you move, you are not going to get strong signals, and you, you end up with a lot of noise. A good thing about this kind of antenna is we can electronically turn toward the source, and as a result, you can get a much stronger signal, and because of that stronger signal, you can actually penetrate much deeper into the atmosphere, and that is really critical for weather prediction. So again, we were very happy and glad that uh, ever joined me for the for the launch, and the middle person here was uh, the Minister of uh, Science and Technology from Taiwan. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Steve Volz uh, from Nestis and Neil Jacob, uh, who was the NOAA administrator. Um, anyway, we're all very happy. So I told you that, um, that Cosmic 2 is really important in giving you uh, better depth in terms of penetration. So after we launched the Cosmic 2, we say, well, how can we figure out that and compare Cosmic 2 compared to the other missions? So what we did was try to say, OK, let's look at the lowest point of each radio quotation profile we have and plot them. And we also try to find co-located profile from the other missions. And so when we did the statistics, it was very interesting. The mean for Cosmic 2 uh, was like uh, the lowest point was 0.65 kilometers. So we can actually track those 0.65 kilometers above the surface. And when you compare to the, all the other missions that we have that operating at that time, 
the mean is 1.8 kilometers. So you're missing that depth of 1.2 kilometers. Well, yeah, build is all nice, but does the model really care about that 1.2 kilometer difference? <laughs> Do we really make a difference? Uh, you know, something that uh, we like to look into. Uh, I know we have some great uh, uh, PBL export here, and I wanted to show you a few diagrams which you might find it interesting. Well, the, the left one is basically showing you, let's say that you got uh, your data, your data count at eight kilometer, let's call it 100%. So as you descend uh, from the surface, from the eight kilometer down to the surface, and see how much you lose in terms of percentage of data. And uh, you could see that uh, the, the not so good one are the meetup A and meetup B. These are the, the European satellite. They didn't really have a good, uh, I call it open door tracking. Uh, and you know, this one had the deepest penetration, the break nine. Guess what? That's cosmic too. So you can actually get a lot. Well, you say, well, this is more the same. But more is it's not the same because you draw the one kilometer horizontal line here. At one kilometer, these guys are uh, having less than 50%, less than 50% of the data at one kilometer. Here, we get about 90%. So that is very important in my opinion. And the other one here is we also say, hey, why don't we just look at how much depth you can penetrate, depend on how strong the signal would be. So we try to look at all the soundings, all the profile, and some we are not having strong signals. So if you look at 500 volts per volt to 2,500 volts per volt, and you see that we're tracking the US GPS system in blue line, and then the GRONUS in green line, you could see that when the signal is low, we stop at about, I don't know, uh, it's uh, maybe this is, I don't know the scale here. Oh, here's zero to one kilometer. So this is maybe about um, 800 meters, and here we are getting like 400 meters, 300 meters. So you can see that it is actually proportional to how strong, how much you can penetrate deep into the atmosphere. And this is, this is the diagram I show for Peter. Why do you care about this? And as you go through the uh, 0.65 kilometers, you are going to go through the transition of the boundary layer height. And when the, we find that when the radio wave goes through the boundary layer top, it was a huge jump in terms of the bending angle. It was a kind of shooting up. And how much, we call it the bending angle lapse, is how much change on the bending angle you can have. So what we did was uh, try to project how much uh, change the radio quotation can, can measure. And we find that when you have strong signal, you can actually measure a much greater uh, shift in terms of bending angle uh, amplitude. And that actually helped us uh, having a stronger skill to determine where the boundary layer height is located. And so actually you can, you can now use this to uh, map out the global distribution of boundary layer height, both over the ocean and over land. So it's actually quite important. So now uh, we want to talk about how radio quotation might impact tropical psychogenesis. And I wanted to first acknowledge uh, my collaborator, uh, Shi Fong Den, who was a postdoc from Taiwan, been working with James Dong and me, and he's very, very productive, and we've been working together on this uh, tropical psychogenesis problem, and also with Su Ya Chen, who was uh, also a, a cosmic scientist uh, before. So, well, we all have to be using models for tropical psycho prediction. So you might be wondering how well are we doing in terms of models forecast skill in predicting the tropical psychogenesis. So this is a diagram done by Paul, you know, Dan Hilprin back in 2016. And he had this uh, interesting diagram, and he shows that uh, on the uh, y-axis here, it's the probability of detection. On the x-axis here, he's called it the success ratio. And false alarm is one minus success ratio. And so he compared the model performance from European Center, NCEP, UK main office from 2004 to 2014. And it, interestingly, uh, both, uh, this is over the North Atlantic, and he find that for GPS, uh, the GFS, the NCEP GFS, uh, UK main office, European Center, 
they all are close to about 0.2 in terms of probability detection. What does that mean? I mean that if you have 10 tropical cyclones, only they can only detect two out of 10. Well, that's not very exciting. That's not very good. And then you say, okay, well, what differentiate between the, all the three models is actually the success ratio. So European Center is about 0.7 success ratio. It means that if European Center predict 10 tropical storms, three of them are fake, seven are real. And our friend in, European, uh, in NCEP, we have a, uh, we have a 4, 0.45, so that means that uh, every 10 storm we predict, 5.5 are fake. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not very good, right? And uh, of course, uh, when I present this, and my friend at NCEP say, Bill, why are you keep on bad mousing us? You know, we are doing much better now. You know, we, we got every three, we got a bunch of data simulation improvement. We're doing better now. Okay, well, this is the latest score I got. In they have a 2018 and 2020, they are evaluating the GFS version 16. Well, we got a very, very tiny improvement, maybe 0.05, and they actually did improve better in terms of success ratio. So they actually now move to um, 0.25 in terms of probability of detection, and they force, reduce the false alarm to about 0.4, which is, which is pretty good, actually. Okay, well, so you can see here, prediction of tropical psychogenesis is still a big challenge. So I wanted to show you um, how radio quotation uh, could help uh, improve the tropical psychogenesis. And this is a case in, uh, in, in Tea Park in 2008. It was a case called Typhoon Nuri. Interesting, this particular case, none of the operational model was able to capture the tropical psychogenesis. Uh, luckily, because of the insistence of Mike Montgomery, <laughs> they actually go out and fly the airplane, and he has some formula, back of the envelope calculation, say, we're gonna have this tropical cyclone, we gotta go out. But of course, he, he was wrong sometime. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so we did a three-day assimilation of, uh, uh, of, of radio quotation data, and then try to see how that might make a difference. So on the right-hand side here, is uh, the, the forecast uh, with assimilation of radio quotation on the left hand side, we don't. And so this is actually the integrated cloud hydromedia, uh, you know, basically simulated from the, from the warp simulations. And uh, so you can see that we are kind of following the storm. Uh, at the beginning, they all look about the same, but you can see on the right hand side, because of, uh, uh, it seemed to be seem to be stronger, rotating a little bit uh, stronger, and then seem to have a stronger convection popping up. And with time, it seems that on the right-hand side, you see more organization, and they seem to be starting to wrap into nines, and then the nine kind of wrapping around each other, and lo and behold, here we cook up a tropical cyclone. Yeah. <laughs> on the left-hand side, when you did not assimilate the radio quotation, it just never was able to make it. Well, well, this is magical, but how did it happen? Right? It's, we want under, <laughs> to understand how did it happen. So what we did was try to look at the two simulation, and we're doing this almost like a Lagrangian comparison to say, okay, we were just sitting right on top of the storm and following the storm through the three-day data simulation period, because this is, this is kind of the forecast period. I wanted to see how the atmosphere was changed because of radio quotation data simulation. And so this is kind of interesting diagram. It showed that we did a three-day data simulation. So this is minus 72 hours right at the beginning of data simulation. This is the end of the data simulation. And our forecast started at this point. The, the graph that I just showed you, the movie just showed you, started at this point. So if we follow the storm, you know, tracking like 500 uh, kilometers, uh, uh, you know, uh, by 500 kilometers uh, following the Final mini bubble centers, and notice that um, this is a kilogram by kilogram, and you notice that the contour here is showing the difference in water vapor. So basic assimilation of the radio quotation was able to recover the water vapor. The first day, we did not have a lot of change because we did not have something near the tropical cyclone. Starting from the second day, it started to accumulate moisture underneath, and by the end of the second day, you get enough convective instability, here shows up. This is the color is representing the vertical motion. So you get a strong vertical motion because convection, and that stimulate the vortex tracing and, 
uh, leading to the development. So it was uh, actually, it makes sense because if you, if you don't have the right observation at the right time, at the right place, you're not gonna make a difference. Of course, this is cosmic uh, mission. We don't have a lot of data over the tropics. So, well, again, you know, I was very excited about the results. Talked to the NSF folks, they said, well, Bill, it's only one case, who cares? <laughs> Well, that's true, it's the right case. You're just lucky, you hit, you, hit the, you hit the right button at the right time, right? So uh, this is the next, the work was done by Xi uh, uh, Dun and, and James Dong. Uh, so we were looking at uh, how the tropical cyclogenesis could be taking place in different environments. And of course, we wanted to look at more cases, so we look at certified cases and if you look at the statistics, uh, you know, classifying the tropical psychogenesis in different environmental conditions, and uh, he found that we can actually classify into eight different types. And there were type four and type, type uh, seven, uh, the classical kind of easterly wave, they are, they are occurring, the tropical psychogenesis taking place along the easterly wave, and the type uh, two, five, and six, they are more associated with the monsoons, than the southeast monsoon coming in. So the question is, that does it make any difference between different environments? And if you look at more cases, does it really matter? And uh, so we look at um, 22 cases of uh, monsoon type and 13 cases of easterly wave type, and the statistic distribution is compatible with the climatology. That's how we, how, how we find out. And when you look at the NSEP uh, reanalysis uh, at the time of formation, it's interesting that um, there are distinct differences between these two different types. And it appears that the easterly uh, wave type, they tend to be smaller, more compact, actually stronger bauticity, but have, actually have weaker, uh, you know, the color here is reflecting the 700 minibar relative humidity. They tend to be weaker. And if you look at the uh, monsoon type, they tend to be bigger, weaker, and they seem to have a lot of environmental moisture. And so these two uh, kind of different environmental conditions. And when we, so we look at these certified cases and we try to uh, look at how much uh, that might differ between the two. So this is type four, seven, five, uh, six, and two. And notice here, here this is East three type in this particular case when you don't assimilate the radio quotation, it's zero, you don't get anything. But you assimilate, you increase the probability detection to 57%. And this one, uh, again, also is to be web, 16.7 to 60.7. And the monsoon type, this one, it doesn't make a, a lot of difference whether you have assimilation radio quotation or not. And here's another one, have some increase. Anyway, if you summarize the East 3 web type and the monsoon type, Interestingly, the easterly wave type, it, it raised from 7.7% to 61.5. So actually that's, that's pretty impressive. In the monsoon type, their impact is not as large. And of course, uh, if you look at this column here, basically saying that if you don't assimilate radio quotation, in a monsoon type, you can still capture like 54.5. It's because you got sufficient moisture already in the environment, whether you have more assimilation or not, it only helps a little bit, not, not drastic. But it also show here is that it seems that the E3 wave because it's smaller and it's drier, and the moisture may be subcritical, and if ends up kind of messed up with your moisture analysis, <laughs> you could be blowing up that, that forecast. So anyway, it's uh, interesting to, to show that uh, it does matter which type of environment you have, and uh, uh, clearly that the history wave, we can get a lot more impact. And so uh, for the history wave, we basically increase from 7.7 .7 to 61.5, and for monsoon type, it still have impact of 54 to 72.7. Again, I'm very excited about this, and I, was, I said, well, I was hoping to get a praise from NSEP, uh, and then I talked about the talk, and I also talked to uh, my friend at Jim, uh, at NIO, James, Do um, James Doyle. He said, Bill, you only study half of the problem. What do you mean? I mean, we saw 35 cases, it's all good. <laughs> he said, well, you only study those cases that make tropical psychogenesis. How about those ones that did not make it? <laughs> the false alarm one, because that's a big problem. What are you gonna do about it? 
oh my god, <laughs> we, guess, we need a lot more case, a lot more, a lot more computing time. Uh, luckily, um, we got uh, Jim and, uh, and Xi Huang, and so we, we, okay, okay, we hear you. Let's go to another 32 cases. So we, after the Cosmic 2, uh, we look at uh, 23 non-developing storms. They all kind of started uh, with the cloud cluster and nine cases of developing storms. And uh, so this is kind of the background showing you the relative Bautista anomaly, and it shows they tend to be happening in the anomaly bands, and also tend to be happening, uh, you know, here's the moisture distribution. So we would like to see, you know, does the assimilation of radio quotation really help you with the false anomalies? So uh, with Cosmic 2 being launched, we are really excited because, you know, here's kind of on the right-hand side showing the data we have without Cosmic 2. On the left-hand side is what we got from Cosmic 2 in three days. Certainly a huge difference. And Cosmic 2 is accounting for 80%. So again, it's a lot of work, uh, and we did the analysis. And, of course, you could look at this uh, developing, non-developing, no assimilation with assimilation. And uh, so interestingly, if you look at this uh, last two column here, no assimilation of radio quotation data, the hit rate is 0.44. But if you uh, assimilate the radio quotation, we were able to increase the hit rate from 0.44 to 0.78. So it's a 0.34 uh, increase. In terms of false alarm, uh, it was uh, 0.73 uh, without the radio quotation assimilation. And with the assimilation, we drop it down to 0.53. So again, it's a 20% you know, improvement here and 34% from the other one. So it indeed um, helped the false alarm. So we are pretty happy about that. And um, last week, I was uh, listening to Dale Barker's talk. And you know these data assimilation folks, they always tell you, just give me more money. I need to improve the data simulation system. And you know, I can just gain so much more with the data simulation system improvements. And almost like observation doesn't matter. <laughs> you just keep on giving them more money to improve the model and data simulation. I really don't think that's true because just, I'm, I know you're gonna complain that I'm comparing apple and oranges, but I'm still gonna do it. <laughs> so, you know, NSAF, up to 10 years of model improvement, a bunch of improvement other things, the probability of detection improved by 0.05, and false alarm was reduced by 0.15. But at Cosmic 2, we increased the probability of detection by 0.34, and with reduction of false alarm by 0.2. So actually, I know, I'm gonna get a lot of criticism. Hey, you're, this is not the same, but I'm just telling you, don't ignore the observation. I just cannot believe how can you say predict convection without observation. You got to have those observations. So okay, um, so that's part on the tropical cyclone genesis. So uh, interesting question is uh, that lower part of the observation does it really matter? So this is again a collaboration I have again with my uh, wonderful MQ colleagues. I have Jenny San, In Zhang, and I also collaborate with. Uh, uh, Yan Huang, uh, Hong, uh, Unidata, and, and also with Central Weather Bureau. So I know that we have some of the MQ folks uh, participating in the pre-ship 2022. Why is pre-ship important? It's because during the May and June kind of the spring to summer transition period, they tend to have these, uh, they call it the quasi-stationary front and they tend to develop convective systems along those fronts. And those fronts, uh, they don't have a lot of um, temperature contrast, but they have huge moisture contrast. And these major convective systems can develop. And first of all, I wanted to point out to you uh, where is Taiwan. You know, you can see the big uh, blue contour here. This is, this is Taiwan. And, and I could see that there is a kind of a, um, Main Yu front kind of hanging around. This is uh, uh, this is uh, southern China uh, here. Southern China is over here, and then you can see this convective system is going to develop. Very often here is that those convective system would develop along the main front, particularly over the Taiwan Strait, 
And then within a few hours, they're going to make landfall over Taiwan with steep topography and dump a lot of rain. And just to show you how that works is that you see here, uh, where is Taiwan is located here, you can see this one competitive system coming in, dumping a lot of rain. And then here is going to be another system going to be formed uh, and again develop and then dump a lot of rain, continue one after the other, kind of form over the Taiwan Strait and then make landfall and dumping a lot of rain. And the problem you have here is the same location is receiving repeated convective uh, development there. And it actually caused a huge amount of rain. So of course, uh, the definition of heavy rain is different between different places. So for this particular case, in 19 hours, this location was receiving 723 millimeter of rain. <laughs> 723. Wow, that's a lot of rain. Well, and as you can see here, uh, people are trying to <laughs> swipe out the waters. It's all flooded. Um, something is floating over the street. So uh, interestingly is, uh, well, does um, the radio quotation make a difference on prediction of heavy rainfall? So interesting about this case is that this happened in, uh, uh, May, on May uh, 22nd of 2020. And it's, it's kind of a unique situation because, you know, European Center, they are much more aggressive. They was kind of getting ready to use Cosmic 2. So they were able to start operationally assimilating on the 25th of March. Well, luckily or unluckily, uh, NCEP did not use the Cosmic 2 data until the 26th, about four days before this event happened. <laughs> so, so the operational analysis from NCEP did not have radio quotation data from Cosmic 2. So does it really make a difference? Okay, I'm just going to show you one diagram. So this is uh, the moisture analysis at seven, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at 950 minibar. And on the right-hand side, you got the European Center. And on the left-hand side, you got the NSEP global analysis. And look at this. Here's Taiwan. And here is the, the water vapor, the Q gram per kilogram. Look at this big ball uh, part of moisture. What, what happened here? There's no moisture. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, you're not going to get good, good uh, prediction on the rainfall. So we try to do a border cross-section and try to look at this moisture distribution. So here's Taiwan. And the crayon color is showing the radar echoes and do a border cross-section here. And here's basically the front is located. And so the color here is representing the moisture transport, basically Q times wind. And you notice that maximum the moisture transport is about one kilometer here. And you know, you, above four kilometers, you basically don't see much of anything. So you know, does it really matter? So what we did was we did the four uh, experiments. One, we did not assimilate a customer two. You know, all the radio quotation data. And then the second one, the GPS-1 experiment, we use the local operator. And what is local operator? Basically treating the observation like it's a, a point measurement. And GPS-2 here is uh, we are using something we call non-local operator, basically more uh, accurately model that ray pass. And uh, so the final experiment is uh, we basically also use a long local, but we don't use the data below 2.5 kilometers and see how that works. So again, this showing you uh, the data we are simulated. And uh, interestingly, if you look at the integrated moisture transport, again, at the 22.00Z, uh, again, this one, no radio quotation assimilation. This is assimilation with the local operator. This assimilation with a long local operator. This is the one we cut out the bottom 2.5 kilometers. And I hope you can see the difference in terms of the, the moisture transport. And of course, with that, it will be impacting the rainfall prediction. And this is a six hour rainfall prediction we got for the different four experiments. This is the observation. You know, we are not perfect by, by any ways, uh, by, uh, but it, it certainly was uh, using a long local operator. We are doing a better job on that. So uh, here I just want to, sh you know, of course this is nice graph, but in terms of precipitation score, 
we actually repeat this experiment and look at 10 forecasts. And we see that uh, the, the best one in terms of uh, fractional skill score, uh, this is uh, the, the, the red line here, and particularly on the heavy rainfall amount, uh, the GPS tube with the long local operator is performing the best. And this uh, green line is the local operator, and the purple line is the one without the bottom 2.5 kilometers, and the blue line is no radio quotational simulation at all. So you could clearly see that the non-local use of the accurate operator is very important, and if you cut out the bottom 2.5, it doesn't really help you. Uh, and here's the bioscore again. Uh, we are doing much better with uh, the non-local operator. Interestingly, we also look at the, the next uh, 12 hour between, I mean six hour, between seven to 12 hour forecast. And you could still clearly see the impact of cosmic two data simulation still better than uh, the other. So it was actually interesting to see that that impact on the convective forecast can last all the way out to 12 hours. This is actually quite encouraging. So uh, in summary here, I hope I convince you that radio quotation is a proven high impact, low cost global observing system. And COSMIC2, because of the high signal noise ratio, deeper penetration in the tropical lower troposphere, we can detect the moisture, capture the sharp bending, uh, sharp change on the bending angle at the top of the boundary layer. And they actually be helpful for tropical cyclone formation prediction and the heavy rainfall event. And I want to again emphasize detecting water vapor in the lower part of the troposphere is really critical for people who are care about the weather. And why I'm pointing point out this point is that you know, right now there are many commercial companies. They say, we, we know how to do radio quotation. Government just need to buy the data from us. Well, they don't tell you. They don't do very well on the bottom part. <laughs> so they can say, hey, you know, I can produce 12 southern profile per day. But, but if they are not getting that critical observation in the bottom part, it's, it's not as helpful. And I think it is important that uh, UCA and our government continue to explore the development of uh, better technology so that we can really push the envelope. And um, uh, again, we all know that water vapor is a big problem because of high temporal spatial change. And it is the worst variable that has been predicted by the model, worst <laughs> to parameter, to analyze, and to observe. And it, yet it's most important for, for weather and climate. So we really need to put in more effort to, to capture the water vapor. Um, so I would say going forward here, we need to continue to uh, advance the radio quotation technology. We need to get to the cross surface as possible. Right now we get to point 0.65. Why don't we go to point 0.1, right? You know, I think we should continue to push the end bit up. And there, are, there are other challenges also, and it's how you use that data is, is continue to be a challenge. And so we should continue to improve the quality and accuracy of the measurement. And the, the final point here is I wanted to um, uh, convince the uh, data simulation folks that how we use the data is critical because it's, it's a, how you specify the you know, observational error, how you do your QC, how you, what kind of observation operator, it does matter. And we really need to put in effort on that. Uh, it's, it's not like one size fits all. And I can tell you, particularly when you get down to uh, high resolution prediction, you know, that ray is actually going through a long regions. And you cannot misuse it by saying it's a point value. It's really not a point value, it's really a, Nine average. And Haidin Zhang also just recently did a uh, paper which is very important. It talked about how we can use the measurement to determine the observational error. In the past, people basically used one, one set of observational error for all profiles. And so you may have good profile versus bad profile. They all e weight equally. And we actually can have information on how quality of the observation and you can assign bigger weight for the good quality and lower weight for the lower quality. And we actually show that it actually improved uh, the, 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 the data simulation and the results. Uh, finally, just want to acknowledge our sponsor and our collaborator like NSPO, NOAA, Air Force, NASA, and NSF. 
And most importantly, I wanted to express my sincere thanks to MQ. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you a story. Uh, <clears throat> In, in 1997, we start planning for cosmic mission. And we were all excited because we got a visitor coming to visit us, and we think that you know, we're going to sign the contract and start building the satellite. Well, guess what? It turned out uh, we had to go through really tough contract negotiations. So we did not actually get funded until like 2001. And um, so I was uh, going to bring, I hope Rich still remember Ingrid Moore to support me on the Cosmic. And uh, <clears throat> I say, why don't you come over? We're going to start this exciting project. And then three days later, I tell her, sorry, we don't have the money. <laughs> so, so, so she had to go back to MQ, uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, while we were planning for that mission, uh, there was actually a period of time. There's no money. And I have to, I have enough money to cover the staff. I don't even have money for myself. And was so grateful that MQ kept me as a senior scientist so I can, I can continue to work on the mission. <clears throat> so I want to say that um, no, we are, <clears throat> sorry, we are now planning for the same uh, scientist, uh, scientific appointment modernization. I think it is absolutely critical that we make sure our scientists had the freedom to explore something that new science and technology. Because if I don't have that MQ support, I would not be able to do cosmic. With that, thank you very much. Bill, floor is now open. Comments, questions? Boris. Very nice talk. I I support your results. Um, <laughs> Thank you. My my, my <clears throat> experience is much more limited experiences in uh, convective storm forecasting in mid latitudes. Again, it um, seems to be that low to mid tropospheric moisture mm -hmm. makes all the difference. Equally important. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. But I do have one question. Yes. Don't if I recall, doesn't the occultation process still require some soundings? some actual, you know, radius on type soundings to establish the profiles correctly? No, the answer no? is no, yes. Uh, okay. Let me explain to you here is, we can actually get the vertical profile of bending angle and reflectivity. We don't need um, the model, first case, or anything like that. Okay. But if you wanted to retrieve the vertical profile of temperature and water vapor, you do need to have some kind of a first guess. But, if you, but most of the data simulation people say, hey, we don't want to do that. We want to go straight with the raw measurement. So we just assume the bending angle, assume uh -huh. the refractivities. Okay. Yeah. So. But you would need a first guess for an actual sounding. That yes. You if you wanted to get the, uh, you wanted to retrieve the temperature and water vapor, yeah. then you need it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you that the moisture at the middle level is, is very important. And actually, Shifong and uh, James' study show that the mid level of moisture is very critical because uh, as you do to get the tropical psychogenesis, the convection, if you don't have the middle level moisture, it can be diluted and you cannot support a convection and it would, it would not make it. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, we have a question from uh, Bowen Shen. Thanks very much. Uh, what's the performance for track and intensity predictions of selected TCs? So track and intensity prediction. Oh, track and intensity. Well, uh, well we did. did not do those work. Uh, I, we have some work uh, in the past, not a huge statistic. We actually did uh, study the um, the T Park, and it was actually improving the track forecast by 15%. Again, uh, for intensity forecast uh, based on limited cases, we also see uh, improvement on that, but we did not have a huge amount of statistics on that. Yeah. Sue, so, please. Yes. Hello. Yeah. So, um, oh, um, you first, 
I didn't see. You say it works better if you do direct assimilation of the bending angle. I don't understand how that works as a derived variable. Would okay. you explain a little, please? Okay. okay, let me explain to you what it, how it works. So in the real atmosphere, the ray would enter the uh, atmosphere and then go through the whole depth and then exit, right? And you get one measurement, and that kind of give you the how much bending you have. So in the data simulation, if you wanted to perfectly or better assimilate that data, what you have to do is take in the model atmosphere and you run the whole ray through the atmosphere the same way. So you kind of say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna transmit from the GPS in my model atmosphere. And so that ray will go through the real atmosphere and you see how much bending you have. And you find, oh, these two bending are not the same. Then you have to be backward to say, well, what kind of temperature and water vapor change do I need to make so that these two can be the same? So I have to go back and forth, back and forth, iterate. Eventually, I bring them together, and they find, then, then you see, oh, with that assimilation, I'm changing certain amount of temperature and water vapor at different places, different locations, yeah. So that's how the data assimilation works. But the so-called local operator is basically saying, well, it's too much trouble to do the tracing that whole atmosphere. I'm going to pretend that observation is that at the middle point is one value, <laughs> rather than going through the trouble of recreating that ray pass. Yeah, that must have been a non-trivial. A non-trivial, and I would say, to, to and I wanted to also say that uh, to the MQ folks, uh, if, if Jack Deal is here, is that uh, we actually implement the non-local operator in WOF DA. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, it has been kind of. Um, not in the latest version, and also not been incorporated in the JETI MPAS. I really like to see if we can do MPAS JETI with the non-local operators, but it's not there. We need, to, we need to work on that. I think we can do a lot of very interesting experiments. Yes. Hi, Bill, great talk. I, you know, I'm so excited about all these results. I <laughs> do tropical cyclogenesis, and I can't wait to, to be able to see how this, you know, work is applied across basins and um, hmm. rather than a question i just had a comment you know i was out there in precept i was in yunaguni it was so moist all the time yet it wasn't raining ah. and it just you know it it only rained when it was either a mayu front event or a, 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 a very large synoptic scale that we got you know those big s storms and it just got me thinking about how these moisture gradients are so important, and, so and, important. and this, this data is showing it, the observations are showing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the one, one big challenge here is that um, we got a vast South China Sea. There's one, some, one, one station, it's the Dongsa station, that's it. <laughs> Empire of South China Sea, vast area, it's about almost half the size of the United States. And so, so in my opinion, this kind of observation is critical, and get down to the bottom is critical. Uh, you know, you, you can apply for your maritime continent, regional climate, you know, Q, MJLs, it's many, many important problems related to this. Uh, Bill, that was real, really fun. I was hoping, uh, being a novice, that you could <laughs> Explain why uh, bending angle changes so much when it goes through the top of the boundary layer. And okay. just a kind of follow-on question. There's other examples where turbulence in the boundary layer actually disperses light waves, raised sound waves, things like that. Do you have to take that into account? Turbulence, yes, yes, yes. Okay, in anticipating of a question from Peter, <laughs> I have this diagram. I knew that you were going to ask this. So, um, so this is, a, a, again, a diagram that uh, created by Sergei Skolovsky. So we kind of try to project a different um, soundings that are going through the boundary layers. So a case like this, it's very hard to see real transitions. And for another case here, and you can see that it's kind of jump, right? This is the, this is the measurement of the bending angle the bending angle. And so this one, you can clearly see how much uh, jump that would be. 
Uh, and this again is another one. And so when you go through uh, that boundary layer top, uh, we, this is uh, the red line is showing you the, um, the bending angle and the blue line is showing you the refractivity. And so the bending angle, you could see a much sharper change and the refractivity is kind of showing you a refraction. And so uh, when I was saying about the, uh, the bending angle left, I'm talking about like change from this point to that point, how much change can you detect? And when you got strong enough uh, SNR, then you'll be able to properly measure that much of, of shift. Uh, and, and so, in fact, we, uh, you can, you know, we have algorithm. You can use the, you can develop an algorithm to detect the boundary layer height, you know, using this, how much transition you have. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time. Let's just take uh, one more of those uh, questions. I think the second one was answered already. Uh, does COSMIC 2 have data for the uh, cyclone Amphen that occurred on May 20th, 2020? over India. Oh. Yeah, cyclone Amphen. Uh, does uh, Cosmic 2 have data for the Cyclone Ampa? That that, yes, the answer is yes. And in the case I'm using is exactly the May 20th, 2020. So I will be happy to, to uh, provide you the data or we'll work with you on those case. Um. OK, um, yeah. Yes. Uh, compliments here, great talk, uh, <laughs> nice talk. Um, um, do you have a rough idea of what percentage of cosmic two observations of warp DA system rejected in the lower troposphere? Small print. Okay, well that's a, another very interesting, uh, interesting aspect about, about the cosmic two is that um, uh, we have Cardiac at Joint Center. Uh, they have been looking at, uh, any, anyway, after we launched on the Cosmic 2, we were very excited about the Cosmic 2 should have an impact. And it turned out NCEP um, so far have not been showing convincing positive impact from Cosmic 2. And so Hui Xiao uh, at Joint Center and been looking at to what happened. It turned out <laughs> the old quality control algorithm is so strict they remove 95% of the Cosmic 2 data below five kilometers. Well, you spend all this money getting these advanced receivers, and yet you throw out 95% of the data. It really is not good. And so we actually have, uh, we are now working with them on how we can use uh, the so-called local spectrum with basically a parameter to quantify how good the data and we actually have results showing that you can use a more physical parameter for quality control rather than simply compare model and observation and it's just throw it away or whatever because model could be error too. And, and so I think we have a smarter way of doing that. I would say in terms of the quality control for the system that we're using, we are throwing away not more than like 20%. Yeah. Okay, I think we better wrap it up here. Obviously, a lot of interest. Yeah. And, uh, thanks so well, much. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So.